business. Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show, where I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. We'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. Hey, welcome back to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm very, very excited to have Jason McElhone on the show today. Jason's gone from stockbroker to becoming the founder of successful companies, remote sales and remote online. Jason's made over 1 million cold calls since 1992. Um, He recovered from bankruptcy back in 2007. He's actually generated over $250 million in revenue. Plus, Jason has a whopping 42,000 LinkedIn followers and over 25 million views across all of his content. Jason, how's it going, man? Very good, Sam. I appreciate you having me on today. No worries at all. Thanks for joining. So there's loads we want to cover in today's episode. Um, The audience are keen, as well as myself, to kind of learn about your background, how you got into sales, how you got into business, um, some of your tips and tricks for kind of helping businesses grow, your digital marketing strategies that you used along the way. But first things first, Jason, let's, let's learn a bit about yourself. Let's learn kind of your background in terms of where you grew up, how you got into the business world. Um, so let's hear it, man. Yeah. Um, grew up in a small town of upstate New York. Uh, it was a town called Antwerp, about 2,000 people. I am the oldest of five. I've got a sister a year younger and three younger brothers, uh, ranging from 35 to 44. Uh, I myself will actually be 50 in this April, so life life goes by fast. Big milestone. Uh, I played football through college. I went to St. Lawrence University, and then in 1994, after spending almost two years at MetLife selling insurance door to door, I got in the car with my sister and her then boyfriend who became her husband and drove to South Florida and that kicked off a 14 year career uh, as a stockbroker half of which I worked out of my house in Delray Beach made an absolute fortune but as you said in 2007 I actually saw the crash in real estate coming when they were giving all the way these free loans without documentation and I loaded up on what's called QQQ puts My problem was I was about six months early, Sam, and everything expired worthless, and that created a run on the bank. I lost my cars, my boat, my fiance, my self-esteem, my dignity, and I actually ended up on a forklift in rural Georgia making nine bucks an hour at the age of 37. Oh man, that's, that's some serious blow. Now, um, before we kind of get into detail about kind of what happened and, and all those events. So you said you, you left college and then you, you went into insurance sales. Is that right, Jason? Yeah, I was, I was dating my high school sweetheart at the time and her father was a manager at MetLife. So okay. I, of course, thought that I was going to marry this girl, you know, the whole white picket fence story. <laughs> Sure. And uh, her, her father said, well, why don't you come and sell insurance for us? And at 22 years old, going into grandma and grandpa's house was the most intimidating, but one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever had. So if anybody out there is considering selling insurance, particularly if you have to go door to door, it's a heck of an experience, but be prepared for quite a struggle for the first year or two. Cool, man. I bet, I bet that's some hard work. I bet it's a steep learning curve as well especially in the starting few weeks. Especially when you're young. I mean, when you're 22 years old, you're just out of school and you're trying to tell someone who may have a a large estate. I lived in farm country, so we knocked on a lot of farmers' doors and most of them were multimillionaires, had 300 head of cattle. And I can still remember them looking across the table at me like, do you even know what you're talking about, boy? I mean, come (laughs) on. You're telling me and the wife to buy a million dollar policy and I don't even think you could afford gas to get here. So you were properly thrown in the deep end, it sounds like. I was, uh, but it was a tremendous experience. And in May of 1994, I said, you know what? It doesn't look like we're going to be hitching up with the high school sweetheart. So my sister just graduated college and she said, hey, we're going to go to Florida. Do you want to come? So we actually loaded up my 1988 Red LeBaron and uh, drove to Florida for 24 hours straight without stopping, of course. Wow. Awesome, dude. Awesome. So you, you kind of gave in the, the insurance sales then, was that right? And moved, moved on to Florida? Yeah, moved on to Florida. I spent a few months in Daytona Beach. Okay. Uh, 
goofing around. And then we ended up in a town called Pompano Beach. And literally the first night that I got there when we got an apartment, we only had $1,000 to our name. My uncle had loaned us the money for the apartment. And on a Tuesday night, I went to a place called the Baja Beach Club and met a guy who was an owner of a brokerage firm. He said, hey, kid, you want a job? I came in the next day and became a cold caller, started studying for my Series 7. And within six months to a year, I was making you know a few hundred grand a year and then some. Um, and wow. then that kicked off, as I mentioned, a 14-year career as a stockbroker. So how was that kind of transitioning from the life insurance sales into, into kind of cold calling for the stocks and shares? Yeah. Um, my father was a welder. My okay. mom was a, a stay-at-home uh, mom. So we, we were what you would consider lower middle class. Barely had enough uh, to get by, but we always had plenty of love uh, in the house. So when you're 23, 24 years old and you start making two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, it was a major shock to the system. And as you might expect, uh, I went completely off the rails for a while, you know, staying out four or five nights a week till two, three o'clock in the morning. Are we talking Wolf um, of Wall Street mad? Are we? Well, speaking of Wolf of Wall Street, I, and I've mentioned this on every podcast. Everybody knows Jordan Belfort in the movie, of course, that Leo DiCaprio played the role in. Um, I actually worked at one of their sister companies. They were out of New York. I was in Fort Lauderdale at a firm called Biltmore. I was only there for about a month and a half uh, before I realized that if I stayed, yeah. it was going to be the absolute end of me. Because if you saw the movie, it, it was total mayhem. Stuff that you could never get away with today was going on in every nook and cranny of, of the firm. Oh, man. Um, and I had enough... I realized that I better get out of here or, or my life is going to become total debauchery and I'll never get out. Yeah. So you kind of saw that coming in terms of uh, it would have a negative effect on your life and you, That's you got out early. So then I moved on um, to a couple of boutique firms. I spent four or five years at each one. And okay. then in 2000, um, I decided to start my own franchise with a company called Brook Street. I built a house in Delray. It was absolutely, you know, gorgeous. My office overlooked the pool. I had palm trees and Sounds a beautiful. fleet of cars and speedboat and, you know, a, a lot of fun for a number of years and, until it exploded. Okay. So what, what kind of happened? So you were, you're run, working in this, running this co, what, what kind of, what happened to, to make it explode? Yep, there was another uh, movie called Margin Call. Uh, for those that are fans of the stock market, where it basically depicts the story of, you know, everybody from the mechanic down the street to the stripper in the club had four or five houses. And we were getting these houses with little or no documentation. And that was back when it was, you know, 0% interest rates for four or five years. But then the economy started to slow down. And I said, something's going to happen here because I started seeing all these for sale signs popping up. There's just no way when these rates readjust that these people are going to be able to pay for these homes. So I started buying, as I mentioned, a ton of QQQ puts. The problem is I was losing time value with each month. I didn't have futures like I should have. So about six months before the, the complete meltdown, my options went worthless. So instead of making a little over $4 million, I ended up going to bankruptcy court and, and lost everything. Oh, dude. So, so you literally lost kind of everything you owned. You lost your, your fiance, was that about right at the time? Or? Yeah, I sold my house in Florida for much less than it was worth. I can remember unloading my speedboat. I paid 77 grand for it. I sold it for 28 in the same parking lot, ironically, of the Baja Beach Club that I started the whole adventure off on. Oh, no. And I uh, built, uh, bought a spec house in, in Georgia near my sister. But things got so bad uh, when my business went that I had to drive a forklift just to survive and my confidence was so shattered because uh, my fiance left and I honestly don't blame her. It got really, really bad that I thought I was only worthy of a $9 an hour job. And that's no knock on many of the blue collar friends that I have. It's just that I didn't believe in myself. I was just completely destroyed at 37. And again, I'll, I'll soon be 50 that I, I thought that if I could just load boxes onto a pallet and regroup, Maybe just maybe I would get enough confidence to to move on and, and pick myself up by the bootstraps. And Definitely. Eventually I did. 
And I mean, that's that anyone's self esteem is going to take a huge hit after that massive incident would, would happen to you. So I completely understand what you're saying. So how did it turn around, Jason? What, what kind of brought you back to life? What gave you your energy? What gave you the, the kick, kick up the backside, as we say in the UK? Yeah. Um, I can remember like it was five minutes ago. I was actually at the factory where I was loading pallets. It was for Craftsman Wrenches, which is a, a tool company here in the States. And it was the middle of summer, middle of July, over 100 degrees in the factory. And I went to the bathroom and I had on these ridiculous looking goggles. And they kept sliding down my nose as I was looking in the mirror, washing my hands. And I just totally broke down in tears. Um, there was actually a coworker beside me who thought I was having the big one. It was a very traumatic experience. But it wasn't until that moment, that day, that I looked in the mirror and said, you effed up, Jason. It wasn't the market. It wasn't your colleagues. It wasn't the president of the United States. It was you. <laughs> you got over leveraged. You were living, as my grandfather used to say, like a goddamn fool for so many years. And I accepted full responsibility in that moment. And literally, about a week or two later, I quit that job and ended up getting... Um, a job building out a lead gen department in a firm called Market Source that I spent almost 12 years at before I started my own company last year. Oh, right. So how did you find the, the Market Source role? That was actually uh, as a result of my brother-in-law, who, again, married my sister. Okay. He worked for the parent company, which happens to be the largest staffing organization here in the U.S. Um, and he said, you know, you, you got to get out of that. You got to get off that forklift. <laughs> You got to get back to what you do best, which was cold calling, because I spent years uh, you, cold calling, done in Bradstreet cards by the thousands every week. Yeah, man, you learned it at a hard end. Yeah, so I went in, I got I had an interview, and they saw something in me as, as shattered as I was as a man, and they gave me a chance. And, and literally within a year or two, I had rebuilt my credit from about five and a quarter to over 700. And I ended up building a few houses over the next 10 years. And, you know, even though I've invested a ton of my own money to start this company of mine, remote sales and, and remote online, I have no debt outside of my home and I'm much stronger now than I ever was uh, back then. Amazing. So at market scan, you kind of worked your way up from, from cold calling, right, right, right up the ranks. Is that right? Yeah, it, it started, it was starting to morph the time. And I've, I've spoke a lot about this and hopefully we can get into what I talk about, the modernizing of the sales process, AKA multi-channel. Yeah, man. When I first got in the broker's business, it was smile and dial, baby, right? There was no internet to speak of. There was definitely no social media. There was no iPhone. The customer depended on the broker or the salesperson for almost everything. You know, we used to have to mail out a package after I spoke to somebody on the phone, wait a week for it to arrive by mail. And then after they had a chance to read it, I'd call them up. Uh, nowadays, 65% of the buying journey is done online before they engage a sales rep. And we've got everything, you know, in including social media, iPhones, everything's wireless, digital. So it, it morphed the last few years into a lot more email marketing and now, of course, social media and personal branding and content creation. And, and now I think we're, we are entering a decade of what I think will be the most transformative, earth shattering for many reps in the history of our country. Definitely. Back to our world. Definitely, man. So back then, you were, you were making cold, cold, cold calls to prospects and then sending them out packages that you had to wait several days for them to actually receive. And once you knew they've got this package in the mail, you could give them another call, give them a follow up. How's it going? Did you get the info? So nowadays, yeah. obviously, we can just ping an email across and we know within yeah, a few seconds. Had, we, exactly. And we had what's called proof of concept where we would only open the account on 100 shares, usually of a big name like GE or Pepsi. Got it. And it was a classic, you know, hey, uh, Sam, give me a shot on 100 shares of GE. If I make you money on this one, we'll go bigger on the next. Fair enough. And they had my brochure there. They knew Pepsi or GE. They said, all right, it's only a thousand bucks. I'll give you a shot. Boom. And, you know, we built business the hard way back then. In hindsight, though, I actually think it was easier in many respects because the world we live in now is very noisy. And it's True. about to get a hell of a lot more noisier on sites like LinkedIn 
as more and more people start to create content and engage with their prospects way beyond just the standard cold call. And that's a great point, Jason. I didn't actually think of that until you raised it. The fact that there's, there is so much noise out there now with the way that businesses can communicate with their potential target customer. Just to name a few, you've got email, you've got social media, um, you've got calling, you've got all these different channels that you can connect to buyers with. But back then, I guess it was just mainly the call and sending stuff in the mail and maybe fax. Yeah. And What's also going on literally right before our very eyes is this whole TikTok phenomenon. That's true. Uh, where, you know, the prospect, the audience, they want to not only be educated, but entertained in 10 or 15 seconds. So if you're a sales or marketing professional who's listening to this podcast, and again, thanks for having me on, Sam, you really need to simplify your message. You, mean, you need to get to the point right now. If you've got a, an email script that's five sentences long, you might want to consider making it one or two. If you've got a cold calling opener that goes beyond 30 seconds, I personally think it should be 10 seconds. You need to get people engaged and paying attention right away and part of the quote, the quote discovery process, or you're going to lose them. I mean, try, try going to a party now and, and, and giving your 30 second elevator pitch. Nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> you know, if you can't tell me what you do in five seconds, I'm going to start twitching and looking around and checking out my phone. It's, it's, it's not only very noisy, but the amount of time that we have as salespeople to, to capture and, and move people down the sales process or the pipeline, so to speak, is shrinking by the day. Definitely. And exactly like you say, Jason, people's attention spans now are getting lower and lower. So you've got to hit your message quickly and with as much value as, as you can. Um, so although on, this fo although on this show we like to focus on kind of digital marketing strategies, it's always good to talk about some of the old school strategies that are still hitting home hard and that work. So have you got any tips for everyone listening, whether you're a business owner or you work within a business of any sort in terms of kind of cold calling and the best way to get maximum results out of that, Jason? Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's, it's all about multi-channel right now. Um, here in the United States, we've got call centers, you know, pure play call centers that are shutting down by the dozens. And the reason for that in large part is not only remote work where it's now much cheaper to have reps work from home than in these gigantic commercial properties, but the technology has advanced to such a level that most prospects don't want to talk to a salesperson unless they absolutely have to. And if that prospect is 40 years of age or younger, it's almost all about text. It's WhatsApp, it's Facebook Messenger, it's Instagram, it's in large part growing to become LinkedIn, which I think is in, in its infancy. So if you don't have something beyond the phone, you're in big, big trouble. So for me personally, I like to start with the email. I okay. think the email mm -hmm. sets the, the tone, creates what I call a beachhead. Because you can have your social media links, your website, your value prop in terms of your message, you can attach files, you can embed video. There's an enormous amount of information and value that you can embed into an email that it really makes sense in my opinion to start there. I then follow that up depending on the market that you're in within a few days to no more than a week. Because as you know, Sam, 90% of calls are going to go to voice. If you don't have that email there first and you're a, someone who leaves voice, you have nothing to reference. They're, a stranger's not going to call you back if there's nothing that they can look at. But if you say, hey, I'm following up on the email that I sent you last week, the subject line was X, Y, Z, do me a favor, call me back, or feel free to respond to the email I sent you. Again, the subject line was X, Y, Z. When we started mentioning in an email, the subject line, not once, but twice, we went from 2% callbacks to over 10 and close wow. to 15% at the last firm I'm working at. So it's email, it's call, it's voice, you then want to engage on social, but not high pressure uh, tactics. Maybe we can go into deeper detail in a minute. Yeah, man, we can touch on that in a bit. I'm also a huge fan, last but not least, of texting. 97% uh, of all texts are open, about 25% of email, and less than 10% of phone calls are answered these days. So you want to get the text involved in your multi-channel cadence. But you can't be high pressure. It's that's what I was going to say, actually, Jason, because that's always something I think myself as a as sales professional. When should we use the text message? Is it a last resort? Because obviously some people like being messaged. Some don't. If you've barely talked to your prospect, 
Is it worth sending a text because they're not replying to your emails, they're not replying to your calls? Is text a last resort for you or? Yeah, that's a great question, Sam. And that's why I like to start with an email. And it's gonna vary from industry to industry in terms of how much email or how many calls. But it's email, it's call, it's voice, it's reach out on social. For me, it's in large part LinkedIn, but I'm also about to establish a YouTube, uh, Facebook, as well as Instagram channels. And who knows, maybe I'll even get into some TikTok. Oh, man. And then I'll, I'll come up, uh, you know, bring up the rear, so to speak, with the text. But the text will be very casual. It'll be, hey, Sam, uh, just following up on the email I sent you last week or the voicemail that I left, one of the two. You got a second to chat or you got a few minutes to chat. There's no call to action beyond let's connect, let's talk. I'm not going to throw my value prop in there uh, because if it's not worded properly or it sounds too salesy, I'm going to lose my chance to have a conversation with that person. Makes sense. No, I think, and I think those are really great tips, Jason. So you're saying kind of start with the email, then work in a call a few days later, um, do some social touches, some light engagements, and then perhaps a text, a casual text a right. few days and, later. And, and in reference to social, this is also important. Let's say you're putting together a prospect list of the top 100 accounts and you've got two or three personas, a total of 300 in your so-called list. You want to dive into Sales Navigator and find out of those 300 people who's creating content on LinkedIn. And you want to make it a habit of engaging and following their content, not with any sales ask, but, you know, hey, really interesting article, Sam. Enjoyed when you mentioned XYZ. Real simple like that where you call out a specific aspect of a video or a blog that your prospect shared. And I can promise you what they're going to think is, okay, it looks like Jason's a sales guy. Got it. But he's paying attention to me. He's checking out my content. He's showing a genuine interest in me. And he's going to do that a few times, maybe even over the course of a month or two, before he tries to email me or call me. So even though I start with email, phone, social, I want to be engaged in the social outreach at the same time or preferably before the process actually begins. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so those are some nice nice little hints for any business owners or any sales reps listening in on ways to really engage with your prospect and different different points that you can kind of reach them at. So, all right, after, um, so it's, you kind of worked your way up through market scan, Jason, up to being a director level, is that correct? Yeah, I was a director um, for, for most of the, almost 12 years I was at market source. Awesome. Market source. Sorry, my apologies. And, and then after that, what, what happened? What was the next stage for you? It was literally, uh, I got to a point where I was burned out. You know, I did all I could do as far as I was concerned. I had a heck of a time, a lot of support at the company. Uh, they had no lead gen department. When I first arrived, we built it into a, a machine. And as an organization, we not only helped drive $250 million of revenue for the company, but when I left, Market Source was driving over $7 billion of revenue for our clients each and every year. So it was an insanely successful operation. As I said, I'm almost 50 and I said, I think I've done what I can do here. And I woke up literally Friday, March 1st of last year and I said, that's it, I'm done. I didn't have any long-term plans. I went in, I resigned. I did it respectfully, and uh, it, I went through a, a traumatic period of mourning. When, you know, maybe the audience has gone through the same. Whenever you spend a quarter of your life with an organization, it becomes like family. So I was literally in the parking lot in tears for almost an hour before I could even leave. And I spent four or five days drinking way too much alcohol and crying myself to sleep because it, it felt like a funeral. I bet it took a while to sink in as well, especially if you've been with an organization that long. And like you say, everyone becomes part of your family, really. Yeah, and I had no intention of starting remote sales. I knew I wanted my own business or at least the ability to have a flexible lifestyle where if I want to work from home, great. If I want an office either as a full-time sales leader or as a partner, I wanted to have that choice. But I didn't get the name for remote sales for almost a week. And then Remote Online came two months after I resigned okay and then and then so, like any business owner i scrambled like hell i ended up selling my 401k i don't recommend people do that 
but when you're trying to launch a business and you don't expect to have income for six months or longer, you've got to do what you got to do. So thankfully we had our first client, that project lasted almost five months. And now I'm in the process of being really, really close to signing on with, with a new partner that I'm super excited about. Awesome, dude. So how did the idea for remote sales and remote online come about? That's such a good question. I could spend days talking about this. <laughs> I was on, if you can see behind me, this is actually my house. Over my shoulder right here is uh, the living room. I was sitting on that couch in my favorite spot. And I said, okay, God, now, now what? What am I going to do now? I, I've quit my job. I'm probably going to blow out of my 401k. Who knows if that's a smart move? What, what the hell am I going to do? And I started thinking about the time I had in Florida when I was overlooking the pool and I was trading stocks in my underwear. And I was just <laughs> having the time of my life doing what I love. Living the dream. I was living the remote dream. <laughs> and I said, okay, you've been remote. That's what you absolutely love. You've been in sales your whole life. And then it was like a ticker tape across my forehead, remote sales. So I literally run over to my laptop. I went to register.com. I typed in remote sales. It was available for 10 grand. And I was like, oh, oh wow. 10 grand. <laughs> uh, guy in Miami, Eddie, if you're out there watching, how are you, buddy? Um, I choked on that price for a good week and a half. And then I said, you know what? I can't come up with another name. I certainly tried. So I ended up paying Eddie uh, 10 grand for it. And thankfully, I actually think I overpaid for, for remote sales, uh, but I absolutely stole remote online for, for just a few hundred bucks about two months later. And that became, of course, a job board that not only serves sales folks, but 20 categories for the United States, UK, Australia, and Canada being our primary markets. And awesome. for anybody watching right now, there's over 4,000 jobs listed it's absolutely free for job seekers so i would go to remoteonline.com when you get a chance create a profile upload a resume uh you'll be glad you did brilliant so often we say in the sales game especially when you're offering your product or your service to potential prospects or customers you're looking to either fix a pain that they're currently having or you're looking to kind of give them pleasure make them happy make this product kind of be everything to them. So it sounds like you flash back to your memories of being in the sun, selling stocks kind of remote. And uh, that, that was a happy and good time for you. And uh, that, that light bulb flashed up. And that's, that's where the, the business idea came from. Absolutely. And, and I don't want to paint the picture that I've got it all figured out because I don't. Um, anybody who's ever started a business and, and, and claims that it was a rocket ship as soon as they you know, launched is probably not telling you the truth. So I've had many a sleepless nights over the last nine months, but we have accomplished a lot in terms of the job board in particular, uh, getting our first client with remote sales. And as I just mentioned, uh, I've got one partner in particular that I hope to announce a deal with very shortly that I think the LinkedIn community in particular is going to get a huge kick out of. <laughs> well, best of luck with it. So yeah, it'd be good to know kind of, I know, You've, you've been um, running this business for a few months now. So what are some of the highs and lows that you've experienced, Jason, whilst, whilst running this business? There's an old saying, right? It's, it's always going to be three times more difficult and three times more expensive than you think it is. So did I think that I was going to blow through most of my 401k in, in six months? Hell no. I had, you know, a decent six figure nest egg and yet, 10 grand here and five grand there and a little advertising here and no paycheck because I didn't file for unemployment. And then it's like, you know, holy shit, you, you've blown through most of this. You better get your act together or, or this, this ship is going to sink before it sets sail. So, uh, but, but my advice to anybody who's listening is when you love what you do and sales has been my entire life, I'm a huge fan of part-time remote, nothing against going to an office, what I am totally against and I'm going to fight probably for the rest of my life for is this whole idea of you better get your ass in here or else because we live in a world where you can work from anywhere. As long as you, what I call play by the rules and produce, you follow the direction set forth in your contract and you hit a number. I don't give a shit if you're in your mother's basement, buck naked. If you're hitting your number and you're playing by the rules, you're on the team. 
But if you're out getting drunk on a Tuesday afternoon, we're going to have a big problem and you might be off the team. That's the world we live in. So uh, in the U.S., Sam, only 4% are full-time remote. And in 40 years, it's only gone from a half percent to 4%. 96% really... of our population drives to work most, if not all, the week. The good news is 43% are home at least one day a week. So I am dedicated a portion of my life through remote online, and I'm about to start a YouTube channel to really crank up the volume, to giving all those job seekers out there, single moms, retired vets, pre-retirees, or people who are just sick and tired of not only driving to work for an hour or two a day, but polluting the hell out of Mother Earth. If you want an opportunity to work from home, regardless of what industry you're in, I intend to be one of the biggest voices, and the vehicle will be remoteonline.com. Nice, man. And I didn't realize the stats were that low on the amount of people working remotely or from home. That's, and that's, that's full time, Sam. So 43% are home at least once a week. So Forbes just had an article by 2027 for the first time ever, 51% or more of the world's population will be at least part time remote, but you can Google it and you'll see that only 4% are full-time remote employees from home in the US. We've got over 150 million people working and, and about 6 million do it full-time from home. Some good stats there. And I'm, I'm hoping your journey, you can increase the amount of remote workers because I do a fair bit of remote work myself. I'm very fortunate that where I work, the company that sponsors this show, Web Choice, let me work, work from home when I need to, as with my colleagues. So yeah, I really, really wish you well on that journey. And I think it's an awesome course. Now, Going back to the main focus that we want to tune in on here is kind of your tips and tricks for really harnessing the power of digital marketing to grow your business. I know you're a bit of a LinkedIn guru. You've got a great following there and your content gets some huge engagement. So what digital marketing channels should businesses really be utilizing now, Jason? Yeah, and this is really going to become evident, uh, I hope, in this next partnership that we're about to announce. I cannot stress this enough to everybody who's in sales or marketing, whether you are out knocking on doors or you're sitting behind a screen all day, there is something called the 90-9-1 lurker rule. And it's been constant for 15 years, Sam. 90% of all social media lurks. They don't say a word, they don't log in. And if they are logged in, they may be watching what you're sharing in terms of content, but they're not engaging, 90%. 9% are lighting up the comment section. Those are the power users that are heavily engaged. And for over 15 years straight, and Facebook just had it on their earnings not too long ago, and LinkedIn announced 610 million members, a half of 1% create content, 3 million people. So if you're out there, 99.5% of you, and you're scared to death, like I was, you're afraid of what your colleagues or your boss are going to think like I was. I'm telling you, you need to plug your nose, you need to face your fear, and you need to do it anyway. You can write, you can podcast, you can be a guest as I am. I don't have my own podcast, but I could be a guest for the rest of my life and probably have as much impact with folks that are generous enough to have me on like Sam. And then you've got to do video. Even though video reach is not what it was six months ago, it's a great way to get in front of your audience so they can see, feel, hear, and, and learn to not only respect you, but to fall in love with you. And when that happens, they want to buy whatever it is that you're selling. Amazing. And that seems to be a tune that's running throughout a lot of guests that I've had on the show so far, Jason. A lot of our guests are saying you really need, especially if you're dealing B2B business to business in that kind of empire, you need to get onto LinkedIn and you need to start putting out content. And here's, and here's the key. Do it without any sales ask whatsoever. You have to give, 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 give. Gary Vaynerchuk's a good example, whether you like him or not. Every day he's spitting fire, probably 100 pieces of content every day on all the major networks. But only once a quarter, he'll say, you know, it'd, be, it'd mean a lot to me if you bought some Empathy Wine, one of the companies that he owns, or it'd mean a lot to me if you buy some sneakers for your, for your kids, he's got a K-Swiss deal. So he spends 89 days just giving, 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 and then once every quarter, he asks you for the money and he gets it. The problem that we have, and this is pandemic in the sales leadership community, 
is they want instant ROI. Yeah, Jason, but where's the money? How much money are you making? Answer, not much in the beginning. You're, all, you're trying to build credibility and trust and likability. And then over time, it took me two years to go from 1,200 to 42,000 followers. I went from no views to in November and December, over 2 million views in one month, all from text posts, by the way. Now, okay. if I turn okay. the ticket on after two years and say, hey folks, I'm getting involved with company XYZ, and let's say it's a SaaS organization. Invest in this for 20 bucks a month, I'm convinced it's gonna change your life. A simple pitch like that, because people have engaged in my content for 24 months, they'll say, you know what? I like Jason, I trust Jason, I don't always agree with him, but I am gonna buy what he's selling because it serves a problem that I have that needs to be solved, and I wanna help this guy out. But if you go in with expecting an immediate overnight return, you're gonna suffer and you're gonna end up quitting. And that's in large part, Sam, why it's only 1%. For every one that gets in, another one gets out. Not just because of the haters, but because there's no immediate ROI and they just say the hell with this, I'm throwing in the towel and it's a big mistake. Yeah, and that's, that's something I, I really strongly agree with, Jason. I mean, recently in the last few months, I've dedicated um, some time each and every day to make sure I put out some content, a decent post, and then engage with other people's posts and comments um, at least a, a w one hour or two a day just to make sure. Because like you said, it's all about playing the long game. And I often compare putting in the work on LinkedIn to what we do at WebChoice SEO, search engine optimization, is a long-term game of getting your business website slowly ranked on Google up to page one. You won't get instant results, and if you only want to do it for a short while, you're not going to see anything. Whereas just like LinkedIn, just like social marketing, social selling, if you play the long game and you kind of give, 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 and then eventually ask for the take, then it seems to, seems to pay off. So, it's, so you... true. It, it's so true, Sam, and if I can make one final point on this. If you want to leapfrog, 99% of your competition, start creating content. Even if you got a face for radio like me, I'm not the best looking guy in the world and I'm carrying 20 extra pounds or maybe 10 because I've lost a bit lately. But I'm not, you know, some of these stars you see on Instagram and YouTube, part of the reason why they're so successful is they look really good in front of the camera. But I can promise you guys, if you speak from the heart, if you have a message that's designed to serve others, and you spend months and maybe even a year or more giving, 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 and then an occasional ask, give, give, give some more, and then an occasional ask, you're going to get to a point for all you cold callers out there. I have shared so much content and engaged with so much of the community that I would estimate about 20% of the folks that I reach out to now, oh, hey, Jason, I love your content, or I hate your content, or somewhere in between, but at least they know who I am. And that's when your conversion rates and ultimately your pipeline are going to go through the roof. That's it. It's a great starting point if they already know you. So um, that's, that's some real sound advice to any, any sales reps or any business owners listening to, to get everyone on social and make sure they dedicate a little bit of time each and every day to putting in, putting in that work. And like you say, if, uh, if you can build up your engagement and start inbound leads coming in as well, then it's, it's only going to help your business. So, Jason, your, your two businesses are online, remote sales and remote online. Is LinkedIn the only way that you're driving inbound sales to those sites? Are you utilizing any other digital marketing channels? Uh, um, LinkedIn is primary, but I've already registered the names on Facebook, Instagram, although I, I just can't seem to get into the vanity of Instagram. I may go the route of a TikTok, which seems to be a major threat to them. Who knows okay. what will happen there. And as I mentioned, I'm about to do at least one and possibly two YouTube channels. Um, so my video presence, if you will, is about to go way up because I've gone four or five months because of this prior project without any video. It is very, very powerful. You're not going to get the reach that you get with a text post. But when you combine the text with podcasts like this uh, and video, along with your cold calling and your email marketing and your event attendance, and you put all those half a dozen or more channels together, there's an old saying, perception is reality. If your prospects, your audience sees, hears, reads, listens, watches you everywhere, the perception, Sam, Sam must know what the hell he's talking about. I see him all over the place. I just, in fact, I was checking out your LinkedIn. You've got a ton of articles. How many articles do you have? 
Quite a few, actually. A lot of those have been at kind of past companies. Um, I don't even yeah. know, man. There's loads. <laughs> yeah, they're extremely well written. You've got beautiful thumbnails. When you combine that with what you're doing right now, maybe you start cranking out some videos. You go out locally. Again, I'm not against leaving the house or getting out from behind a screen. You start to have a community, uh, particularly if you've honed in on your target list, and they start thinking, wow, I've seen him, her, read him, her, watched him, her, everywhere. And because, again, for everyone who's listening, I can't stress this enough, 99% of everybody out there is not doing it. That is a fact. It's been steady. In fact, it's a half a percent on LinkedIn. And it's fear and it's ego. It's understandable. You need to get over it. But if you can face your fear and do it anyway, it's like riding a bike. Eventually, you'll get the hang of it. And then a couple hundred videos and a couple hundred posts later, it doesn't even phase you. You just share it. And to your point, you got to invest at least an hour a day responding to comments. That's so important. It's not just about cranking out content. You've got to get in there and engage with the people that have given you their time and their feedback because that's what keeps them coming back for more. Amazing. So from all, all that, these discussions, I'm guessing that LinkedIn is going to be your favorite digital marketing channel, Jason. No question. You know, just look at the organic reach. I, I have posts that are 300%. You know, I, I have 40,000 followers, but when I talked about my bankruptcy, 2 million in one post, 2 million. Now I had oh. to admit that I had a crash and burn, but of those 2 million, the studies show, by the way, for those that are curious, it's a, it's three seconds counts of view, about 10% really absorbed the post. So that's 200,000 people that know who I am, know that I had a crash and burn, which is part of the brand. You want to be real with people. And then of those 200,000, I would estimate about 2,000 are in my wheelhouse in terms of sales leadership or folks who want to work remotely. And if I continue to do a multi-channel, multimedia approach to building a brand without choking them with a relentless stream of sales ass, over time, they're going to check you out on your profile. They're going to say, wow, Sam's pretty smart. I need help with my SEO. I've got a website that's getting no traffic. And because of Sam's podcast and his articles, and the other forms of communication, they're going to DM you, they're going to reach out to you and going to say, hey, Sam, love the podcast you did with Jason. I need an SEO fix right away. Can you help me out? And but that's if you it. Got to stand, like 99%, you're out of sight, out of mind. And I'm telling you right now, in this decade, you are in big, big trouble. So if you're listening or if you're watching, you're a sales leader, a business leader, or just a sales rep, um, whatever part you play in your business, start producing content today. You heard it here first. Yeah, in, in terms of the sales leaders, have everybody into a room, get them around the table. Say, look, let's, let's, call, let's be truthful here. We're way, way behind in terms of our personal branding. We finally understand as an organization that the sum of the parts, to quote a friend of mine, Jake Dunlap over at Scale, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. If we've got 100 sales reps that are sharing content just once a week, that's going to trounce what we're doing on our company page by as much as 300 to one. So we're going to have a conversation right now. What are the rules? Well, no swearing, no drinking, no drugging, no disparaging the company and three or four other things. And if you got a pre-approved stuff, which I don't encourage, but if it's, you know, a big video and you got to run it by a boss, fine. But if you are a sales leader and you are not engaging on social media and creating content, I can promise you, in a world where call centers are going out of business as we speak, you are doomed. The good news, you'll be of, of, of only the 1% who are actually facing their fear and doing what needs to be done. Indeed. Right, Jason, we've, um, we've talked a fair bit about social now. Now, from, from our opener, we know you've done a huge amount of cold calling in your time. So you've, you've done over 1 million cold calls, which is insane. I can't even barely think of that in my head. Um, I, know, I know I've done a few thousand, but nowhere near the million mark, which is a, an incredible feat. Now, in your current business, what would you say is producing the best results? Would you say you're getting plenty of inbound leads from your LinkedIn work? Or would you say your cold calling is giving you the best rewards? Or would you say it's email? Or would you say it's a mix of all three? You asked me that question last year. I would have said a third, a third, a third, a third from cold calling, a third from email marketing, and a third from LinkedIn. Okay. It's now, it's now Sam, dramatically shifting 
towards social. And I'm going to shock a number, or probably piss off a few of my cold calling friends out there and sales leaders who are stuck in the 1990s. I personally believe, and it's already outlawed in half the world, you, you're familiar with GDPR, there are parts of this world where you cannot cold email or cold call. Here in the US, a few months ago, they outlawed robocalls. I can make the case that they're gonna outlaw traditional cold calling within five years. Let's say they don't do that, Sam. I still believe that the idea of cold calling people off a list, five years from now, will be a relic. It'll be a dinosaur. Social media sites, and it's already happening. For example, go to LinkedIn. You can go to your level one connections, and inside the mailbox, you can send a minute long voicemail. You can send a minute long encrypted video that cannot be shared outside of your inbox. And I'm also hearing that texting and a FaceTime feature is on the way. Oh, wow. So, with, and, and by the way, did you happen to notice that the head of product is taking over LinkedIn as the CEO? Is I stepping didn't know that. Up. that was yesterday. I got news for you folks. The guy knows product. I believe within, let's say a year, you will be able to call, email, text, FaceTime, video, voicemail, multi-channel from one location. And it's not just going to be about level one for a price. I don't know, a hundred bucks a month. You can hit your followers and even level two and three. I think social media, all the major sites are going to put the phone companies out of business in this decade. I actually agree with you, Jason. I know it's a huge statement and I know that all the people in organizations and businesses cold calling are probably going to fall off the back of their seat just like that. Um, let me, let me, before I forget, let me, let me explain the, the beauty of this. I believe, like, just take your cell phone now. When someone calls you right now, you see just a name or a number. I have an iPhone. If it's a contact, the name comes up. If not, it's a number. I see a year or two from now, when you get a cold call on a cell phone, you're gonna have a little thumbnail and it's gonna look like your LinkedIn profile. So there might be an inch size uh, picture, your name, your title, and I see one line, reason for the call, uh, lower healthcare call, health premiums by 40%. So when someone calls you in the very near future, you're gonna look at your phone and you're gonna see a snapshot or a thumbnail, you'll see face, name, title, company, reason for the call. And if you're a prospect that's struggling with high premiums for your family, you see, wow, Sam, very attractive fellow, looks like a nice guy, <laughs> works at a reputable firm. Yes, I need to lower my healthcare costs, or in your case, I need help with SEO, boom. I'm answering that call. But if you don't have a profile, if you're not on social media, if you don't have a brand that's creating content, you have no visibility, I could use a, a four letter word, but I won't but you're screwed. You have to, have to, have to go all in on social because it's going to be the form in which we communicate across every channel in the very near future. Amazing. Can you remind me again, Jason, what you said? Your, you said previous year, it was a third, third split across cold calling, across email and across social. What did you say now was your results across social this year or the last year? If I had to give you a number, I'd okay. say six, I'd say uh, two thirds LinkedIn and the other third split about evenly on phone and email. And that's a huge rise. That's a huge I, rise. Still, I still do email. Again, I'll, I'll send email first, follow with a call, leave a voice 90% of the time, reach out on social, send a text. But the, the transformation, and again, I know that some people are going to say, oh, bullshit, the phone companies are going nowhere. I'll still be able to buy lists from Dun & Bradstreet years from now. No, you won't. No, you won't. They're, they're, they're taking control. Zuckerberg and the boys are taking over. They're going to congregate billions of people in one location. The customer, by the way, is going to want and demand to see your profile. They're going to want to see what you got. Have you got a summary? Have you got a decent photo? Are you cranking out articles like Sam is? Are you producing? Are you engaged? Do you give a shit? Because if you don't give a shit, I'm not interested. But when they are optimized in terms of their profile and they get that call on their cell phone, they'll go, oh, there's Jason or the, oh, there's Sam. Yes, I know him. Yes, I've got a problem, that one-liner on the phone. Boom, I'm answering. If not, delete or send it to voice. That's it. You've, you've, heard, it for, you've heard it here first. And you saw it here first. Social is going to overtake cold calling and cold email in the next couple of years. 
And I, I think I agree with you, to be honest, Jason, especially with, like you say, GDPR is a huge thing here in the UK and, and in Europe as well. They're, they're really tightening down on, especially GDPR, it, it basically blocked B2C, so business to home consumers. There's very, very tight restrictions what you can do now. People have to specifically opt in to receive these specific marketing calls. It's a bit looser on B2B, but it's constantly, constantly getting tightened. And the fines that companies can, can take for going over these rules and not obeying them is, is huge. So companies have been fined millions. So I, I'm, I'm really with you on the fact that I think social is going to be the way to go because you've got that kind yeah. of consent. Yeah, and we were told at my last firm, stop calling and emailing Canada. We, we faced a million dollar fine. Now, I do believe you'd have to be an egregious offender. Uh, I don't think someone's going to come after you for a million dollars for making one cold call. Sure. But if you're in the robocall call business, or in some cases, you're using one of these auto dialers where the same numbers call on the, the prospect 15 times a day or a week, they are going to file charges or at least a complaint on you. And by the way, before we move on to another subject, I will not be Sam. If we find out in the next few years that it was the heads of social media, Zuckerberg and, and Google and LinkedIn and Microsoft, who owns them, of course, if they're the ones behind the GDPR, I don't believe for a second that the governments around the world are so damn concerned about you and I sharing private information. I believe there's, there's probably going to be big, big money that's trying to steer everybody to more of a controlled environment. And where is that? Social media. So there'll be regulation there, but I'm not going to be shocked if, if, if Zuckerberg and the, and the boys, watch me get sued for saying that, are, are behind this massive shift to get everybody online. And now that we've got our smartphones in the palm of our hand, I mean, people are addicted. Facebook messages are now it's TikTok. I mean, my, my nephew's 14. Between TikTok and Snapchat, he's got his head down. Oh, I'm over there to see him the other day, and he's just looking down the whole time. During the Super Bowl, I'm like, Ethan, look up. Talk to your uncle. I haven't seen you in a while. So it's crystal clear that's the direction we're going. And I agree with you. And why wouldn't the founders of these huge social companies want to keep you within their platforms and make all of your business and day-to-day -day antics stick within these platforms? I mean, it only makes sense. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's some really interesting insights, Jason. I'm sure they're going to ruffle a few feathers. But I'm sure a lot of people uh, who are already reaping the benefits of LinkedIn in the B2B community and, and enjoying the inbound leads are going to agree with you. So, yeah, that, that was fun. OK, so moving back to your insights and tips to help other business people and sales reps kind of grow their, grow their sales, grow their business. Are there any particular pieces of advice you can speak from experience, Jason, in terms of how you should grow your, your business? If you're a startup, are there any any pieces of or golden nuggets that you can give any new startups or people thinking of starting up a business? Yes. Um, I think we should throw a bone to the cold calling community. Um, again, I spent my whole life on, on the phone. I'm still a big believer in the phone, but it's one of many different, you know, arrows in the quiver. Um, and by the way, for all those out there that are saying, Oh, you can't make a million calls in 29 years. Well, you can make a million calls now in three years or less with Connect and Sell and Monster Connect and a half a dozen other uh, companies out there that have conversations on demand. So it's very, very possible. But if you are going to use the phone, whether you use an auto dialer, uh, a Connect and Sell, or you, you know, doing it the old fashioned way. One thing I learned years ago, and I'll, I'll do a video or two on this again uh, soon, is you have to have what's called a pattern break. The biggest mistake that salespeople make when it comes to the phone, and it's why they're so terrified of it, is they launch into the reason for the call before the person on the other line even acknowledges they're willing to receive it. So whether you say, hey, Sam, it's so-and-so here over at XYZ, you got a quick sec? Or, you know, the folks over at Gong like to say, hey, Sam, how you been? Whether that's real or not. My favorite not is to ask for help. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, insinuating I know you when I really don't. I'm not sure I'm all about that. But the point is, at least they're, they're getting permission to speak. My favorite is to ask for help. And this works, you know, deadly. Are you there? Yep, still here. Still here. That works deadly. I've lost the screen here, so. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. 
Yeah, so it works deadly in terms of the, the phone. You have to have what's called a pattern break. So for me, I learned from a guy years and years ago called Ari Galper, and it's unlockthegame.com, unlockthegame.com for uh, any of you folks that want to check it out after the podcast. Ask for help at the open of a call, and it also works in an email. So for example, you might say, hey, Sam, it's Jason here over at XYZ. Maybe you could help me out for a moment. And if you're face-to-face, knocking on doors, put your hand on your heart and say, you know, good afternoon, Joe. My name's Jason. I'm with a company called XYZ. Lean back a little bit. Put your hand on your heart, i.e., you can trust me. Maybe you could help me out for a moment. I can tell you after doing this, Sam, for 15 years, probably a few hundred thousand calls, 95% of the time, the worst you're going to hear is, well, you kind of caught me in the middle of something. What is it? And I'll double down I'll say, well, you got a few minutes to chat. And until they say yes, I don't proceed. If they say no, no, I'll say no problem, I'll call you tomorrow, click. And I'm very polite, but I'm the first one to hang up. I do not proceed, as my old mentor used to say, never proceed in the face of no interest. Until they say, sure, what do you got? Or yeah, I got a quick sec, or the folks over at Connect and Sell, they call up and they say, hey, Sam, you got 27 seconds to hear why I'm calling. Until that prospect says, sure, You don't proceed. If you got to call them back, call them back. The beauty there is you go into yes mode right away. You got two people that have agreed to have a conversation. The knot in your stomach that's making you nauseous goes away because instead of a run right into the reason for the call, you get the, I do what I can. And then it's important to pause and thank them for it. I really appreciate that, Sam. Thank you. And then it's like any other call. Listen, the reason I'm calling you today is, and then you better have a compelling value prop that speaks to a problem that they might have, followed by a solution that you can offer, and then closing uh, on a time to meet for coffee or to do a demo or whatever it is that makes sense for you. All right, Jason. And I'm, I'm a big fan of the pattern interrupt that works. That helped me out a, a great deal in the cold calling. And I learned a fair bit from reading some of the Sandler books. They, they preach a lot about in pattern interrupts and various sales strategies. So are you saying that any new business should be, if it's a one man band, they should be cold calling, reaching out to their ideal customers via the phone? Or are you saying if they've got a small team that their, their rep should be cold calling? You know, I'm glad you said team because I think we're also heading to team selling. Um, When I was in the brokerage business 20 years ago, we had a half a dozen people on my team. We had a woman that sent out all the invitations to the seminars that we would have at the restaurants. We had someone that licked envelopes and, and mailed packages of our brochures. We had a half a dozen people on the team. I think we're also in, in the 2020s, not only moving to more of a social media world, but more of a team selling atmosphere where it's gonna be much more advanced than traditional SDR AE model, where teams are gonna have groups or teams of three, four, five people each of which is in their own niche. Because one thing I've seen over and over again, Sam, is you can't shove a square through a round hole. If you have people on the sales team that hate to cold call, forcing them to do what makes them nauseous and ultimately is gonna make them wanna quit is a mistake. Figure out what everybody's good at. So if you have SDRs or whatever you decide to call them, you want the people that are good in front of the camera doing social media content. You want the people that are articulate and can write doing email marketing. You want the people that are fearless and have good tonality on the phone. So everybody is not only doing what they're best at, but what they enjoy doing. And together, it creates not only uh, more connection, more camaraderie, more integration between sales and marketing, but I believe a much bigger number in terms terms of revenue. It's not necessary. In fact, it may be counterproductive to go it alone anymore. You've got to have a team where everybody focuses on what they do best. And if it's spread across the multi-channel world that we now live in, all the better. Cool. Okay. So that's actually raised a really good point, Jason. So you're saying if, if you're a business owner, business leader, you've got a team of sales professionals and some either hate cold calling, they're really nervous about cold calling, or they're just not that great at it, then find out what their other strengths are. If they're great at social selling, if they're great at producing video, if they're great at email, then harness that. And let them spend their time doing that if that's what gets results. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, because you know it's it's six times more expensive 
to go only to get new customers than to keep the ones you have. But it's about six times more expensive to go out and get new employees than to keep the ones you have happy. And I've seen it time and time again, Sam, when you force someone, threaten someone to try to do something they really don't want to do, it creates fear and animosity. So the wheel is going to keep on turning. People are going to come and go like you wouldn't believe. But if you sit in front of the team and say, I want everybody from now on to do what you love. Because I've seen people do nothing but email marketing and make a fortune. I'm seeing people now do nothing but LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and make a fortune. You don't have to be multi-channel. If you have a team that dives into whatever vertical they enjoy in terms of communication, you're going to have higher retention, better morale. No one's going to want to leave because I've got a boss that lets me do what I love and what I feel I can contribute to the organization. And so if you can tweak the comps, and I don't have all the answers here, you're going to have to tweak the comp model. But back in the day when we had a half a dozen people on a quote financial group, you just, what's the overall revenue of the entire team? And based on seniority, level of contribution and experience, when it comes time for commissions and bonuses, everybody gets the appropriate amount. But because we feel like business owners, because we feel as if our contribution matters, we're going to fight like hell to get the job done. Amen. And let's be honest, cash is king when it comes to business. And it comes to if you're a sales rep, you want to hit your number. If you're a business leader or a business owner, you obviously want to turn over a profit and grow year on year, month by month. So cash is king. And results are the name of the game in business. And at the end of the day, like you say, if cold calling gets the results, fine. If it's social, fine. If it's video, fine. The only tricky thing is, is when we go back to kind of traditional companies setting KPIs, setting you've got to make this many calls a day. How do you do that with kind of social, with uh, producing video? It's a tricky game. Yeah, it, I'm thrilled you mentioned that. I just did a post three days ago. If I could flush one KPI down the toilet, and I'd like to flush most of them, it's the how many calls have you made today? I know that'll piss off uh, half a dozen or more sales leaders, but I hate that question. I think it's so out- outdated. It's very 1990s-ish. Um, and it, it turns the sales process into a commodity because it is a fact for anyone who doubts me, it is a fact that you have salespeople on your team that are cold calling California at six o'clock in the morning from the East coast, hitting a voicemail just to get their numbers up. That is, a, that goes on rampantly in the sales, in the sales community. You need to get real and modernize with the times. There needs to be a social media component. We, we can measure calls, but I want, to, I want to measure conversations. I want to measure opportunities. I want to measure number of demos created, number of meetings that stuck. I really don't give much of a shit anymore about the number of dials. It's the quality of dials. And then you got to have social media, which almost nobody has. How much time did you spend on LinkedIn today? There's a KPI. How many pieces of content did you share? There's another KPI. How many likes and comments did you leave on your prospects wall? There's another KPI. You add that in with the the emails, the open rates, et cetera. Give me a multi-channel KPI list that goes way beyond the number of dials and and I'm open to it. But sadly, I would estimate two thirds of the sales community is still running the show like it was 1995. Yeah, and and it's a great shame really. And I kind of like your your KPI style that you've just mentioned there with splitting it across channels and doing a more kind of new school, let's say, approach. Because, yeah, like you say. And what you said, Sam, results matter. I mean, when I talk about remote work, I say play by the rules and produce because the only thing that ma- it, it, that matters is results. It doesn't matter if you're at a beach. 40% of freelancers are at a coffee shop. It doesn't matter if you're in a trailer park in the middle of nowhere or in a high-rise building like I was in Fort Lauderdale. If you're knocking the ball out of the park, you should be able to work wherever the hell you want. The same reason, the same principles apply to the sales process. You've now got a half a dozen or more channels in which you communicate. You need to pick the ones that you enjoy and that you're good at. And where you're not good, we're going to find someone to team up with you, in my world anyway, to fill in the gaps. And when you get four or five people humming along, everybody with a smile on their face, just kicking ass every day because they're doing what they're supposed to do, what they love to do, 
that's going to generate much bigger top line and bottom line revenue growth and profits. The challenge, as you can imagine, Sam, is most of the, the sales community is still stuck in how many calls did you hit your quota? You know, what do you got in the pipeline? It's just so 10, 20 years ago that if they don't adapt and quickly, they're going to get run over in the decade to come. Oh, I would argue it's not just in the sales community, Jason. I'd argue it's in business in general. Businesses, a lot that I speak to, they have their traditional way of getting new work, new projects, new sales, whether that's referral, word of mouth, whatever it may be, these traditional approaches, making cold calls, sending email. So these new strategies, LinkedIn, like you say, has been has played a huge impact on your business. I know it's played a huge impact on ours as well in terms of getting us inbound inquiries and growing our sales. So why wouldn't you be open to strategies that work? And why wouldn't you, with your, with your team, with your sales agents, why wouldn't you let them utilize the channels that work for them? And like you say, get their colleagues in to help them with the channels that they're performing not so well on and just make them flourish, make them get more enjoyment out of their work and at the same time help your business grow. So those are some awesome points. So Jason, we've covered some, some great stuff. Um, we've learned your story, we've learned kind of your strategies and your favorite digital marketing channels. Everyone, you've been listening to Sam's Business Growth Show, where we interview business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs across the globe. We find out their story, how digital marketing's helped them grow, and we found out all of Jason's tips and insights. There have been some awesome ones today. The show is sponsored by webchoiceuk.com, a results-driven digital marketing web development app creation company. So Jason, I've got one more question before we wrap this up, which I like to ask all of my guests just before we finish. So if you could thank just one person, either dead or alive, for having a positive influence on your life and your career, who would that be and why? Oh, you had to go there, Sam. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, um, as I always try to be. I've lost both of my parents in the last few years. Uh, my mom had a massive stroke in 2015, uh, was on life support for a few weeks, and then we had to let her go. And my father, a year ago, died, uh, thankfully, in his easy chair without suffering. So if I could be greedy enough to put both of them together, um, there's not a day that goes by that I don't talk to them. Uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't thank them for not only bringing me into this world, but sticking with me through thick and thin. You know, I can remember my father, for example, uh, when I went bankrupt, he was in that factory with me when I was loading pallets on trucks, making nine bucks an hour. He didn't have to be, I mean, he was almost retired, but he was there to support his, his oldest son. And my mom, I can remember, you know, all the warm meals, I played three sports, baseball, basketball, football, coming home at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night when most of my brothers or sisters were going to bed there was always a, a warm meal waiting for me. So mom, dad, thank you so much. And I love you. That came from the heart, man. And I'm, I'm really sorry you've lost both your parents, but I'm sure that they'd be very proud. Indeed. Thanks, Jason. So just before we go, let's, let's hear a little bit about yourself. How can people connect with you? Tell us a little bit about your company. Uh, yeah, there's two ways. Well, of course, everybody can reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn. Again, the name's Jason McElhone. I have reached the, the limit of 30,000, so please follow me. Send me an email, or I do have my contact info uh, on my profile if you want to send me a, a note. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're a job seeker, I would strongly encourage you to go to remoteonline.com, create a free profile, upload a resume, and get job alerts. We have a partnership with ZipRecruiter. All the jobs are pre-screened. There's over 4,000 there right now. So do check it out. And if you're a business, particularly in the startup or mid-market space of, of B2B, and you need help with digital transformation, modernizing your sales process, you can reach out to me at Remote Sales or Jason at RemoteSales.com. Amazing. Jason, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much, Sam. And if there's anything I can do to help grow your business, please let me know.